We'll wait for the clicker to get fired up and woken up this Sunday morning. We spent all of last week thinking about the idea of going all in. And and if Jesus is really all the world to us, that means we're going to go all in. We're going to go all in on our Bible study. And that reminds us that this Thursday night, there is the fourth and final how to study the Bible class here at the building Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So go ahead and mark your calendars if you've forgotten. I did. That's why I'm making the announcement now instead of the announcement guy making it here in a couple of minutes. But if we're all going to go in, it doesn't just affect our Bible study. It also affects our worship. And that brings us to John chapter 4. Because if we're going to go all in on our worship, it must affect our heart. And here in John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to this Samaritan woman, this woman by the well. And if you know anything about the ancient world, the well was kind of like the coffee shop. It's where people gathered to get a good drink. And in the middle of this discussion with this Samaritan woman, Jesus gets to the heart of the division between the Jews and the Samaritans there in verse 23, where Jesus says, but an hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. Here in John chapter 4, Jesus tells us that true worship isn't just about the words that we just sung, the words coming out of our mouth. Jesus says that true worship isn't just about the act of worship. Jesus tells us here in John chapter 4 that worship, true worship, involves our heart and our soul and our mind. True worship involves truth. Following those commands and those examples that we see over and over and over again there in the the Bible. But it also involves the Spirit. And the Spirit is what makes you, you. What makes me, me? It's our heart. It's what we're passionate about. And so Jesus tells us here in John chapter 4 and verse 23 that true worshipers go all in. True worship isn't just about following rules, but it's about passionately worshiping God. And this may come as a shock to some of us here, but we're not exactly great at balancing things. Some of us here, I'm raising my hand right here, aren't great with work-life balance. That may be you as well. But sometimes we're not even great with balancing the spirit in the truth. And I think that leads us to a very uh, important question I want to put before us today. Which one is more important? The spirit or the truth? a pretty difficult question. So I'm going to rephrase it real quickly. If you had to make the choice, had to make the choice this morning between going to a church that worshiped in spirit, their heart was in it. Maybe, Maybe they had some things backwards according to what we see in the New Testament, but their heart was in it and you knew it and God knew it. Would you go there? Or would you go to the church down the street? where they worshiped in truth, according to what we see there in the New Testament. But the worship was dull. It was lifeless. It was motionless. But they sung. They had no emotion. And they looked at anybody who showed emotion with kind of judgmental eyes. You, you know, you raise your hands a little bit, and they're like, I don't know about that, they're showing emotion. Have your hands out like this a little bit. They're showing emotion. They judge anyone and everyone who dares to show emotion. But they sing. The songs don't edify. The songs don't encourage. The songs don't teach. But they sing. Which church would you rather attend this Sunday morning? And my guess, my guess, there may be some people here who are going, truth. I'm going to the church that worships in truth. And and we'll figure out the heart later. And there may be someone here who says, you know what? 
I'm going to go to the church that has their heart in it. And because we have a heart for God, we have a passion for God, we're going to figure out the truth in due time. But the moment we decide between truth and spirit, the moment we say one is more important than the other, is the moment we draw a line that God didn't draw. And when we draw that line, we have a tendency to overemphasize one and to underemphasize the other. But if we are going to go all in and worship God, if we are going to guard our hearts through our worship, we have to worship in spirit and in truth. We have to worship in the heart and act of worship. That's what Jesus is saying here in John chapter 4 and verse 23. And let's go ahead and read it again and also add verse 24. John says there, reading, giving us the words of Jesus one more time. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, I think it's interesting here in John chapter 4 that two times there in the text, two times Jesus says they must worship. True worship worships in spirit and in truth. And what's interesting to me, at least, is that both times the word spirit comes first. I think that's interesting. I'm still trying to wrestle with what to make of it, but I think that's interesting nonetheless. But I think Jesus' point here in the text And our main point today is that true worship goes all in. True worship involves spirit and truth. True worship involves the heart and the act of worship. And so today we're going to look at four examples. Four examples that uh, challenge us to ask the question, am I worshiping God in spirit and in truth? Is my heart and my actions involved in my worship. And and the first example, the first case study is found all the way back in the Old Testament. All the way back in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. So I invite you to go get your Bibles out or your iPads out. We're going to be turning a little more than normal for me on a Sunday morning sermon. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 6 where David is about to move the ark. And so he assembles all the young men in Israel. 30,000 men have gathered together And he, that's David, and all his troops, verse 2, set out to bring the ark of God from Bel Judah. The ark that bears the name. The name of the Lord of armies who is enthroned between the cherubim. And they set the ark of God on a new cart and transported it from Abinadab's house, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the ark. Okay, so the ark is on the move. David's wanting to bring it to Jerusalem, we know. And they're making good progress. Everything is looking good. The ark is moving, and they're bringing, brought with it the ark from Abinadab's house on the hill. And Ahio walked in front of the ark. David and the whole house of Israel there in verse 5 were dancing before the Lord with all kinds of fir wood instruments and lyres and harps and tambourines and sistrums and cymbals. Everything is going well for the people of God. The ark is on the move. And why would they not rejoice like they are here in the text? The ark is finally coming to Jerusalem. And it's easy to see there in verse 5 that David has a heart for the things of God. David passionately loves God. He's doing what he sees in his own human wisdom as the right thing to do. And everything's going well until verse 6. And there in verse 6, they get to Nacon's threshing floor. And when they get to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah reached out to the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen had stumbled. And verse 7 tells us that Uzzah is struck dead. And we're reading that and going, that's a little harsh. Why in the world would God strike Uzzah dead for reaching out to touch the ark because the oxen stumbled? That's a little harsh. Well, Numbers chapter 4 tells us that no one was supposed to carry the ark except for the Levites. And yet right now, the ark is on a cart. 
pulled by oxen. So that's strike number one here in this situation, that they're not obeying what God has to say. But strike number two comes in the fact that Uzzah struck the ark. No one, not even a priest, was supposed to touch the ark. In fact, when they were going to move the ark, they had to stick little poles through the little holes on the side of the ark to move the ark. And so even though here in 2 Samuel 6, David has a heart for God, he doesn't have the truth right. And as a result, it cost Uzzah his life. And maybe you've had a preacher here, maybe you've gone there yourself to show the importance of following biblical authority, to listening what God's word has to say, and the consequences of those times in our lives and our times in our worship that we don't follow what God has to say. And that's a good point. And we need to submit to biblical authority. But I think this story that we are looking at this morning overlooks another important point that we need to consider. And that's there in the parallel passage there in 1 Chronicles 13 and 15. We're not going to go there, but in 2 Chronicles 13 or 1 Chronicles 13 through 15, time passes and David begins to remember, "Oh, you know what? You're not supposed to carry the ark or uh, drag the ark or, you know, on a cart. You're not supposed to put the ark on a cart. The priests are supposed to carry the ark." And so David's like, "You know what? We're going to move the ark." but this time we're going to do it God's way. We're going to listen to what God's word has to say. And that's what they do there in verse 13 of chapter 6, 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 13. They're moving the ark there, and every six steps as they move the ark, they're sacrificing an ox and a fatted calf. One, two, three, four, five, six, sacrifice and so on and so on and so on. Every six steps, they're offering two animals as a sacrifice. They are getting serious about moving the ark. But even though David is worshiping God and he's doing things according to God's divine pattern, what is David doing the entire time? Look there in verse 14. That David was dancing with all his might before God. Of the Lord, wearing a linen ephod. There in verse 16, it describes how King David was leaping and dancing before the Lord, and Michael, his wife, despised him in her heart. We'll come back to that in a second. And if you want to skip up to verse 12, people are rejoicing because the ark is being moved. David was not afraid to show emotion, not a afraid to show his heart when he worshiped God. And so as the story unfolds here in 2 Samuel 7, we see that David had his heart on God the entire time. He just didn't have the truth right. And now that he has the truth right, he continues to worship God in spirit and in truth. But when he gets home there in verse 20, his wife isn't thrilled. His wife's name is Michael, that's Saul's daughter. And she comes out to meet him there in verse 20 and says, how the king of Israel honored himself today. He exposed himself in the sight of the slave girls and of his subjects like a vulgar person would expose himself. And David makes a reply there in the text. But I think it's interesting that Michael isn't thrilled when David rejoices before. See, Michael doesn't say anything when David's moving the ark accord, uh, not according to God's divine pattern. She has nothing to say there, but now that David has heart and spirit both on God, she has something to say and she complains. All because David dared to show emotion when he worshipped God. And there is David uh, replies there in verse 21 and 22 to sum it up. David basically tells his wife, Michael, look, I'm going to rejoice when I worship God. I'm going to get excited about worshiping God. I'm going to worship in spirit and in truth. Here's the thing. A lot of us, I think, are a lot like Michael. We see any sign of emotion in church in our worship service, and we're looking at the person going, ooh, they're, they're kind of crazy over there. They're out of control. They've got their hands in the air. They've got their hands out. They're swaying a little bit. They're out of control. Don't we know we're supposed to do all things decently and in order? When maybe, just maybe, the problem is us. 
that we're not worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's the kind of worship Jesus wants. That's the kind of worship Jesus or David offers the second time. That's the kind of worship we need to give. But here's the thing. So often, if we're going to come down on one side or the other, the truth or the spirit, what side do we normally come down on? We normally come down on the truth and we're like, we'll get the heart, we'll get the spirit later, we'll get the heart later, we'll come back around to it, we'll work on it. But here's the thing. We never come around to working on our hearts. In many ways, we're kind of like the Jews there in the first century. The Jews there in the first century that Jesus has a lot to say about there in the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be there second. We're going to look at Jesus' preaching. That's our next example that we're going to look at. You know, Jesus has a lot to say to the Jews of his day. Starting with the Beatitudes. The first couple of Beatitudes have to do with the condition of our heart. And as the Sermon on the Mount progresses, those of you who are in the back classes remember this from our study in the last couple of weeks. Jesus has a lot to say about the heart. That sin begins in the heart, culminating there in, in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, where Jesus tells the crowds on the Sermon on the Mount, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is telling us there in the Sermon on the Mount that he cares about the heart. I think this has huge implications for our worship. Because if our heart is focused on the things of this world, if our heart is focused on all of the earthly treasures, it will affect our ability to worship God in spirit and in truth. After all, just a few verses later there in Matthew 6 and verse 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve God in wealth. You've got to choose. Who are you going to give your heart and your soul to? Who are you really going to worship? And then later in the Gospel of Matthew, in about Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8, he looks at the Pharisees, he looks at the Jews of his days and says, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart was far from me. We've talked about this before in our back classrooms and in our sermons, how the, the, the Pharisees, the Jew, Jewish leaders of his day, were so concerned about every minute detail of the law and how they built walls around the law to avoid breaking the law. And they were meticulous about making sure they followed everything that the law had to say. And that's good. We need to obey God's law. But in the process, they lost their hearts. Jesus says in Matthew 15 and verse 8, they heart was far from God. Yeah, they were worshiping God according to what God had to say in his word. They were worshiping in truth, yes. But their heart was missing in action. Jesus tells them there in Matthew 15, you need to worship in spirit and in truth. That was a real struggle for the Jews in the first century. And that's why Jesus comes along so many times and tells them, you've missed it. You've missed the point of worship. Yes, you're following the absolute letter of the law, but you've missed the heart behind the law. God wants them to worship in spirit and in truth. And that brings us to Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, where Jesus talking to the scribes and Pharisees has this to say. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. You see, Matthew chapter 23 is in the middle of the fifth and final discourse in Matthew. The fifth and final speech. Matthew is divided up into five separate speeches. This is the fifth and final one we see before Jesus goes to the cross. And the fifth and final discourse in the gospel of Matthew really deals with Jesus going after the Jews for their apathy, for their legalism, and for their rotten hearts. And that's what leads him to say the words he says there in verse 23. I think it's interesting that as he goes after the religious people of his day, he goes after the Jewish people of his day, he doesn't say, guys, you've ignored God's law. He doesn't tell them, just show mercy and grace and love and you're good to go. Instead, Jesus says, yes, obey God's law. Yes, tithe. 
But don't affect, forget about the weightier matters. Don't forget to be just. Don't forget to love. Don't forget to show mercy. Don't forget to be faithful. He says that's how you really praise God with your tithe. So keep the word of God, he tells them. But remember that part of following God, part of obeying God, means you need to have, we need to have the right heart. That we need to love God and love our neighbor as herself. Because if our heart isn't right, there's no amount of tithing, there's no amount of giving, there's no amount of songs that we can sing, there's no amount of righteous acts that we can do that will save us. And yet sometimes we can focus so much on the act of worship that we forget the heart of worship. That worship given in spirit and in truth is more than just checking off a box that yes, we did the Lord's Supper this morning. Yes, we we gave this morning. Yes, we sang a couple songs this morning. Yes, we heard a sermon this morning. Yes, I did my Bible lesson this morning. Giving and worshiping in spirit and in truth is having a heart, a heart that is excited to give back to God, a heart that is excited to praise God. That's what it looks like to praise God in spirit and in truth. And that's the kind of worship we need to offer. I want to look at a third study. And that third study, a case study we'll look at, that third example, is there in Acts chapter 2. There in Acts chapter 2, you know what's going on there in Acts 2, the overall context, that Jesus has died, he's been buried, he's been raised on the third day, and some 50 days later, people are kind of stumbling. What the world's going on here? All of a sudden, these people are walking around talking in tongues. What in the world's going on there? And so Peter gets up before the crowd there at the temple and preaches the first gospel message. And as he's speaking to this Jewish crowd there at Pentecost, he has a lot to say. But what's interesting to me as he speaks to this Jewish crowd is that he doesn't use the first gospel message, that first sermon, to preach about the five steps of salvation. He doesn't say, here's what you got to do. Here's why you have to do it. That's not what Peter says here in Acts chapter 2. Peter starts on common ground. He starts where they are, and then he preaches about Jesus. He uses scripture, but he spoke about Jesus. He described everything that Jesus did for him, everything that God did for him there through Jesus, how they, God had sent his son, according to this verse 23, this determined plan and foreknowledge, and you crucified him. And all of this sermon leads up to this climactic moment there in verse 36, where Peter turns it on the crowd. And he tells the crowd there in verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. Peter spoke the truth, but he spoke it to their heart. And look what happens next there in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were pierced to the heart. They were convicted, and they look at Peter and go, what in the world, brothers, what should we do? That's when Peter responds and says, here's what you got to do. Here's how you obey the gospel. Here's how you respond in truth to what God has planned for you. Here's why you need to be baptized. Folks, people respond to the gospel message when their hearts are pierced by the truth of the gospel message. But this is a real struggle for us. Because we have this tendency in our teaching and our preaching sometimes to keep beating folks upside the head with a doctrinal two-by-four about what the Bible has to say about modesty and what the Bible has to say about alcohol and what the Bible has to say about coming to church and what the Bible has to say about baptism. And we need to talk about those things because the Bible talks about those things. But we can never forget to talk to their heart. And so when we talk about baptism, we need to talk to their heart. When we need to talk to people about the importance of coming to church, we need to talk to their heart and describe how everything God has done for them, how he sent his one and only son to die on a cross for them. And if that is what God has done for us, why would we not go all in in our worship? Why would we not want to worship him 
in spirit and in truth. When we talk about Jesus, we need to start with our heart. We need to help people see their need for Jesus. Because when their hearts are humbled and their hearts are pricked by what God has done for them through Jesus Christ, they'll respond to the truth of the gospel. We cannot emphasize the act of worship. We cannot emphasize the truth of worship without also talking to the heart. Because religion without the heart is legalism. And we need to realize that everything God wants from us begins in the heart. That's what Peter knows here in Acts chapter 2. That's why he speaks to their heart. That's why he goes to their heart. That's why he tries to prick their heart. That's what we need to do too. Truth and spirit. Both are needed to obey the gospel. And yet how often when we share the gospel, how do, how do we do it? When we're talking to that friend or that family member or that neighbor or that someone that we care deeply about, and we're trying to bring them to Christ, trying to bring them to a full knowledge of the truth, what do we do? We have a tendency sometimes to beat them their heads upside the head with that doctrinal two by four and talk about all sorts of other things instead of bringing their heart to Jesus. We could start on common ground like Peter does and slowly but surely take them to Jesus by describing everything that the Son of God did for us, how he loved us so much that he gave his life for us on a cross and let that be the message that pierces their heart. And once their hearts are pierced, that's when we can say, here's what God wants from you. Here's what God has asked you to do. Here's how you can be saved. This is why you need to be baptized. And then we can say, here's water. It's right behind us. What hinders us from going down into the water? Because we do need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. We need to be baptized for the forgiveness. That's when we die to sin. That's when we raise to newness of life. That's what God's word teaches us. But we can never forget that baptism without a broken and humbled heart is just a bath. The gospel message involves spirit and truth, and we can never forget that. But the fourth and final example is found there in the church in Ephesus. There in Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, we'll, we'll take a step back to verse 18. Where Paul tells the church there in Ephesus, And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. Huh, that's curious. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Paul tells the Ephesians how to worship God in truth and spirit. He tells them, hey, you need to sing. And we often go to this passage to explain to people why we sing, why we don't have a five-piece band up here. This is the passage we often go to. But we can't forget the last half of verse 19. Where Paul says, yes, yeah, sing, but make music with your heart to God. Paul tells them here in this Ephesians 5 how to worship in truth and spirit. The church in Ephesus knew the truth. They had the truth. In fact, as their history records, as we know from the New Testament and a little bit of extra biblical sources, they had a, basically a, a loaded batting order of preachers and people come serve the church there in Ephesus. Guys like Paul and guys like Timothy and guys like Silas and potentially guys like John. Guys like Apollos, they had a lot of talented people, a part of their church family at various points in time. But look what John says there in Revelation chapter 2. As he writes to the church at Ephesus, that first letter to the churches in, the, in Asia. John tells the church in Ephesus this, this church that some 30 years earlier was told how to worship in spirit and in truth. Look what John says. I know your works, your labor, your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. 
You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and have found themselves to be liars. I know you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name, and you have not grown weary. And let's skip down real quickly to verse 6. Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Basically, John says here in the text that the church in Ephesus did a fantastic job of standing for the truth. They took everything that Paul said, everything that Silas said, everything that Barnabas said, everything that all their preachers and all their teachers had said, and they stood for truth. They stood up against false doctrine like the false doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And John's like here in Revelation chapter 2, he's like, that's a great job, fantastic job. You're the perfect church. Keep on doing what you're doing, right? Is that what John says there? Look there in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. But I have this against you. Wait a second here. I thought they worshipped in truth. I thought they stood for truth. Look what John says about the church at Ephesus. You have abandoned the love you had at first. They weren't worshipping in spirit and in truth. Here was a church that had Paul, had Silas, who had so many talented people a part of their church and yet they had left their first love. And so John there in verse 5 calls them to repent, to go back to the love they had at first, or else, or else their lampstand would be taken away. In other words, John says, if you don't worship in spirit and in truth, God will judge you. John tells the church at Ephesus here, the last half of the first century. He says, look, standing up for the truth is good, but it's not enough. God wants your heart. Truth and spirit. That's what God wants from his people. Do we realize that? If God was going to give us a letter, was going to have an apostle send the church here at Union Road, a letter. How would it read? There are seven churches in Asia. Maybe it would sound like one of those. Maybe it would sound like one of the other epistles we see in the New Testament. How would the letter that we hear at Union Road, how would it read? You know, I asked a similar question at another church when I was teaching a class on the 12 traits of the biblical church. I, I asked the class, it was an auditorium class, a fairly large class at the time, and I asked the question, is like, what church in the New Testament are we most like? And a man, one of the elders, spoke up. And he said, we're like the church in Ephesus in Revelation. He understood that that church had left its first love. You know, it's so easy for us to get so focused on standing for the truth, and we need to stand for the truth. Don't get me wrong. But we can so focus on standing for the truth that we forget get the heart. I think that's what happened there in Ephesus. And I think that can still happen today. You know how I know that? Because that's my story. I can remember having arguments with various friends, maybe people I was in a relationship with at the time, on which mattered more, truth or spirit. And I was insisted, truth mattered more to God. And I was wrong. It's not either or. It's both. What we need to realize is that worship Worship in spirit without the truth is wrong. But we also need to realize that worship in truth but without the spirit is wrong too. If we're going to go all in, if we're going to bear those characteristics of God in our life that we spent so much time talking about and studying last week, then that means we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. This morning, I want to ask us all a question. 
have we left our first love? When we gather for worship, are we worshiping in spirit and in truth? God sent his son, his one and only son, to die on the cross. He worked throughout human history for thousands of years to make sure his son came into the world to live a perfect life, to die a sinner's death, to be raised on the third day. All so we could be saved. And yet sometimes in our worship and in our lives, we look at everything God has done for us and we're like, oh, that's pretty cool, but I want to do something else with my life. We don't give God our heart and our soul and our mind. Sometimes we don't follow Jesus with everything we got. Do you know Jesus as your Savior this morning? He bled and he died for you so you could be saved. He offered his life to redeem you from the curse of sin. If you'd like to know Jesus as you.